Hello everyone and welcome back to Rocket Science. In this video I want to discuss some aspects of the design of a gas generator liquid fueled engine, in this case a methane oxygen burning engine, and it is the one that you see here, the ED form. The model is not finalized, but uh, it is what we're working with in principle uh, to do our calculations. And this is the sea level variant, which has an area ratio, the nozzle ratio of 22. And actually the chamber is within this cooling jacket. And we will see that in Blender when I show you the model in greater detail. But this is the sea level variant. And then there is also a vacuum variant. Uh, the vacuum variant has an extendable nozzle. Uh, the first reason to do that is to fit it inside a smaller fairing. The second reason is because on the back of our Shinkansen space plane that I'm designing, we actually wanted to operate in a sea level mode and only extend the nozzle at a certain height so that it can then operate at vacuum efficiencies. So if we deploy the extension, we see it like that. And so it's the same engine, just with that additional nozzle extension to get better efficiency at higher altitude. But obviously that's gotta be very cumbersome and we'll see how much heavier that is compared to this in theory. Uh, my calculations so far have been, well, overly generous to the mass, so hopefully we can cut down on that. But the engine thrust is 1,000 kilonewtons that we're aiming for, and let me show you some of the calculations. You are going to have to bear with my handwriting again. So if in this series you haven't watched the design of a pressure-fed lander stage, you should probably watch that to figure out how I calculate some of this stuff, or uh, using RPA light in order to calculate uh, engine parameters. That was another video. And in this case, I got all these parameters from RPA light instead of uh, calculating it by hand, which is prone to errors. Uh, so the chamber pressure is 1,400 PSI or 9.65 megapascals. Uh, that is about the same as a Merlin 1D and probably at the upper end of gas generator engines. So we're going to have to have some decent materials to handle that. And it's 1000 kilonewtons. That's the baseline what we're looking for out of it for our Shinkansen space plane uh, system. The area ratio for the sea level one is 22. For the vacuum, it's 120. So mixture ratio is as you see here. I believe that's a little bit oxidizer rich. Um, and that's the same mixture ratio we used for lander stage already. Uh, these are the efficiencies. If you're using RPA light, you should be able to duplicate what I get here if you enter these efficiencies for uh, the numbers. So uh, 98.6 for the combustion efficiency, 97.7 for the nozzle efficiency, and then you get an overall 96.3. Now, what I get out of RPA light is the temperatures in the chamber throat and exit, in this case, the exit of the shorter nozzle, and uh, the pressures at each point, and the gammas, which are, is the ratio of specific heats. Uh, we will see that later on. And also the velocity. Uh, the chamber is assumed to be still, or uh, sometimes we assume it to be at Mach 0.4 locally. And then the throat is Mach 1, which in this case, because of the density of the material, is 1,207 meters per second. And then the exit velocity with an optimal expansion, so that's not the ISP number that we're going with, is 3,279 meters per second. This is the mass flow rate, which we'll see later on as well. We need to work with that. And the ISP at sea level is 300 seconds in vacuum, 343. So not great for a methane oxygen engine. But uh, if we wanted to improve on that, we could say that we get better efficiency. Um, we could potentially change the area ratio somewhat. Or, uh, but basically the way we're improving on that is by using those vacuum engines with the big nozzles so that with the big nozzle, the sea level ISP is horrible. It's 139 in this flow separation. But the vacuum ISP, the vacuum efficiency, is 373, which is very good. So uh, we can improve with that better nozzle. Um, so the main goal for me in designing this engine was to try and figure out the cooling of it, how to cool the combustion chamber. And the system that we're going to use to cool it is to pass fuel into little tubes alongside the combustion chamber. These tubes will be made out of inconel, and uh, the combustion chamber itself will also be made out of inconel. So it's a very uh, temperature resistant material. Uh, 
and uh, the wall temperature. Uh, so if you take your combustion uh, temperature and multiply it by 9.23, you get the adiabatic wall temperature. Basically, the combustion temperature doesn't all like reach the wall. And then the gas side wall temperature is only 800, or this is like what we want. Uh, we want to keep the inconal at a certain lower temperature uh, with a good margin below its melting temperature. So the, our target gas side wall temperature is 834 degrees Kelvin, or just Kelvin. Uh, so that's a big gap. That means that we have to figure out how to cool it uh, from that adiabatic wall temperature to this gas side wall temperature. Uh, overall gas thermal conductance. Now, I have to be clear. I know I've got this stuff wrong somehow, and I'll explain why. So there's some mistake I've made. These, this is what I think I should be doing, but there's a mistake in here somewhere. And I'm hoping to get some help into figuring out where exactly that is. But uh, looking at the textbooks, if you will, on how to design this stuff, these are the equations, but I might not be applying them right in some way, or because they're using uh, imperial units, American units, and I'm using metric, I might not be seeing a constant that, or a constant might be different than what I'm expecting. So the first thing we need to do is calculate the overall gas uh, thermal conductance and here I can only do an estimate because the more complete equations are rather involved and even then it's still an estimate until you really test it. Uh, of course, with modern computer modeling, they could probably do a pretty good job, but that's beyond me at this point. So uh, H sub G is the density times the local velocity to the 0.8 power. And this sort of makes sense. The velocity is like the kinetic energy of the, of the exhaust gas, and the density, of course, is important. And so that'll give you the overall gas thermal conductance to some estimate. And so in the chamber, uh, from RPA light, I got the density of the material in the chamber at 7.02 kilograms per meters cubed. And here I'm using the estimate that the velocity in the chamber is Mach 0.4, which should be a high estimate. It could be much lower than that, like 0.15. If you wanted to lowball it, you'd go with like 0.15 or something like that. But 0.4 is pretty good for the chamber itself before it narrows to the throat. And we had the Mach 1 velocity up here at the throat. So it's actually probably a little bit faster than that uh, because the density is a little bit more than the density at the throat. Uh, but in any case, uh, we get this number 685 kilograms per meter squared times seconds. And, you know, the, the units should work out like that. Uh, in the throat, the density is lower. Uh, but the velocity is higher, so the same amount of material, the same mass flow is going faster, so the density is lower. But be, uh, as it turns out, once you do the math, the thermal conductance at the throat is higher than in the chamber, and that's going to be consistent. That's just how it is. So we expect the greatest heating at the throat. And so when we pass our coolant through, we're actually going to start it out at the throat so that the throat gets the maximum benefit and so, yeah, that'll be essential to the design. And then at the nozzle exit, it's not that hot. It's this uh, 81.4 kilograms per meter squared seconds. So it's a tenth of the thermal conductance at the throat. So heat flux. Heat flux is the energy that we are going to be dealing with per meter squared per second. And so energy is going to be measured in megajoules in this case. And we're taking the temperature of the adiabatic wall temperature minus the target temperature for the gas side of the wall. And we're multiplying by the H sub G, the thermal conductance. So it's a fairly simple equation. So we're taking the gas temperature minus the target wall temperature multiplied by thermal conductance. And we get 1.7 megajoules for the chamber in this case. This is a chamber right now. Uh, the throat is a little bit higher. I think it's 2.1 megajoules. So we've decided to use Inconal X750, and this has a thermal conductivity at 834 Kelvin of 26.5 watts per meter times Kelvin. 
uh, these units are uh, sort of a pain, but uh, they all work out in the end, so that's the important thing. Now I'm gonna assume a one millimeter thick wall. It actually ends up being much thicker than that just to um, deal with the pressure of the combustion chamber. So I think I ended up with uh, one centimeter or something like that. We'll see that later. Uh, but the coolant side temperature, which so we've got the chamber temperature, then we've got the wall temperature, and now we've got the coolant side temperature. The coolant side temperature, there's the coolant side of the wall. This is not the actual coolant temperature. I know I should probably draw a diagram for this. Uh, at least, and again, this is how I understand it. So on the coolant side of the wall, the wall has probably reduced the temperature by a little bit, is what we're looking at here. And so what we need to do is account for that a little bit. So on the coolant side of the wall, we'll take the gas side of the wall and minus out the, the heat uh, the heat flux times the thickness of the wall divided by the thermal conductivity of the inconel. And so when we do that, we end up with 770 Kelvin, which makes sense. So on one side of the wall, it's 834 degrees Kelvin, we hope. <laughs> and then on the other side, it ends up being 770 Kelvin. Okay, so if we dissipate that 1.7 megajoules and we have a temperature at the wall on the coolant side of 770 degrees Kelvin, 770 Kelvin, and the coolant is 330 Kelvin, uh, we get this equation for the H sub C, the coolant side heat transfer. And I believe this is the reciprocal of the, the amount that the coolant is going to absorb. And I think that because we get a smaller number for methane at 88 Kelvin, than we do for 330 uh, Kelvin coolant. So uh, I, that doesn't make much sense unless this is the reciprocal of what's uh, what we really want. So we got 3,864, and this is a mess of units, but let's think about what this means. We've got joule over meter squared times seconds times Kelvin. Times Kelvin. So the meter squared is the cross-sectional area of the coolant flowing through, right? The coolant flowing through the pipe has a certain area that it's uh, covering, and so th that's the meter squared. Now it's flowing through at a certain rate, so it's going to cover that area in some amount of seconds. And then Kelvin, because of the difference between the wall temperature and the coolant temperature, and then joules for how much energy we need to dissipate. Uh, that's how I understand it, so that's how we're gonna think about it for now. Now we need some of the properties of methane. We've got the viscosity of methane at 770, the wall temperature, and 330, because uh, we, we're probably not keeping methane at 88 Kelvin, that'd be optimistic. That's what it's kept in in the tanks. Uh, it would probably already heat up in the pipes, much less once it comes into contact with stuff. Now, one thing I, I've made a sort of mistake here in that I should have been using the properties of supercritical methane. You see, once it's passing through the pipes at the pressures that we're going to be sending it through, which is about 1,400 PSI or more, probably more, um, at, at that pressure is going to be supercritical at these temperatures, not a pure gas. So we have to deal with different numbers than I've got here, really. But they don't actually make too much of a difference to the problem I'm having. Thermal conductivity K at 770 Kelvin is another number we're going to need. And we're also going to need the specific heat at constant pressure. Uh, 770 Kelvin and 330 Kelvin, we've got those numbers. Now, the chamber dimensions, which we basically got out of doing calculations related to what we got out of RPA light, and again, previous videos covered this sort of thing. Uh, the diameter of the chamber is 0.537 meters, the diameter of the throat is 0.269 meters, and the diameter of the uh, exhaust, the exit, is 1.26 meters. So, there, there's a limited number of tubes that we can array around these this diameter, right? If you've got a tube of a certain diameter, you can't just like put a thousand tubes of a certain diameter around a circumference that, uh, uh, you know, a circumference related to a diameter of 0 
you just can't do like an infinite number of those. So we have, we have a limited number of tubes that we can use. Now, if we're assuming 36 tubes, then we use this equation to figure out how, what's the biggest diameter we can get around this, uh, especially the throat, because the throat is the tightest part. So if we throw in the throat's diameter, and we use this equation to figure out, assuming that we've got one millimeter walls, so for each tube, there's gonna be two walls, so we put 0 0.002 here, uh, so two times the tube's thickness. So if your tube is two millimeters, you put 0 0.004 here and so forth. Well, if we assume 36 tubes, then our maximum diameter is 2.3 centimeters, 0 0.023 meters. So we just work out this equation, sort it all out, and then we get that. So that's fairly wide, but it's not impossible. We just want a sense of what tubes we're going to have. That just for reference, a lot of times it's 100 tubes. The space shuttle main engine had more than 400 tubes. So yeah, those are reference points. 36 is pretty low. It's almost certainly more than that. But I need a reference because of what comes next. And when I tried out working these equations many times before, I ended up with tubes bigger than 2.3 centimeters, which is a problem. Um, coolant flow velocity. So this is the speed it's going through the tubes. This will factor into another equation that's coming up. Eight times the mass flow rate. Now, here I made a little bit of a mistake. Uh, we need to use the mass flow rate of just the methane. Here I've put in the mass flow rate of all the propellant. And so that's wrong. It's uh, lower velocity than here. So when I say seems really fast, well, that can be corrected just by just using the methane amount, then it's all right. Uh, it's going through the tubes at 93 meters per second, which at least is not past the speed of sound. So we've got that going for us, but we're expecting something more like 15, 20, 30, something like that. Uh, so pi times, this is the density of the methane in liquid form. Again, we might want to use supercritical, in which case it's more like 200 or so. And multiplying by the number of tubes and the diameter of the tubes squared. Uh, incidentally, uh, part of the reason there's an 8 in front is because uh, we probably ought to be using the radius squared. And so it's actually diameter divided by 2 squared, and then you get the 4 and then move it up. Anyway, don't worry about it. So uh, what is the coolant side heat transfer of the setup? Well, that's this equation here. This uh, H sub C times D over K. So let's remind ourselves, H sub C we saw before. That's the number that we got out of here, right? Taking the amount of heat, the uh, amount of energy, dividing by the temperature difference. So we've got that number, and then we've got the diameter of the tubes, and we divide by the K, which I looked up. That's the thermal conductivity of the methane. And that sort of makes sense. If you take that all, all on its own, so we've got that amount of uh, heat that we're dealing with multiplied by the diameter of the tube divided by thermal conductivity. So what is that equal to? Well, it's equal to this constant and that varies from 0.023 to 0.029 as far as I've seen. That's one of the constants I'm worried about as far as the units are concerned though. If, um, but I've seen it with metric equations and imperial equations, but it's a little bit suspicious because they probably shouldn't be the same uh, given the different units, unless all the units end up washing out in this equation, which I'm not sure of. Um, the first number we've got here, and I call this a number, it's a collection of four variables here, and that's the Reynolds number. You'll see that a lot in fluid mechanics and flows and aerodynamics. Um, it is density times the velocity of the coolant in this uh, situation times the diameter of the tube divided by the viscosity. And we looked up the viscosity, though, again, uh, different numbers depending on what temperature we pick and whether it's supercritical or not. And we're taking the Reynolds number and raising it to 0.8. And then there's a Prandtl number. And the Prandtl number is, uh, conveniently, that's one you can look up. You don't actually have to calculate it for methane. Um, I happen to know from looking it up, it's 0.87 or so. 
So, but in general, it's the viscosity times the the which got uh, specific heat at constant pressure divided by the thermal conductivity, and raise. In this case, we are taking th uh, that number and raising it to 0.4. So, it uh, actually all this. Uh, there's a little correction factor back here. That's for the change in viscosity. So we're taking the viscosity at the start versus the viscosity at the wall. And so that's just a little correction because things are changing along the way. Uh, but all of that in business comes out to just 0.8. So that's convenient. And since all those parameters are just dependent on the properties of methane, uh, they're going to be constant for the rest of the stuff that we're going to do unless we change the temperatures around, in which case some of these factors are different for different temperatures. So as long as we're saying sticking to our 330 Kelvin for the temperature of the methane, this will be fine. If we change that assumption, then it'll change. But actually the number that this comes out to is not going to be too much different from 0.8. So if our result is way off, um, that's not going to be because of this stuff back here. It's going to be because of something to do with the Reynolds number versus this H sub C uh, D over K. So uh, there is a, a pro if you can't look up the Prandtl number for your particular thing, uh, there's an approximation and it works pretty well. Uh, it's just four times the gamma. Remember all the way back here, we have our gammas, the ratio of specific heats. Yeah, well, here they, here they go again. So, um, oops, going too far ahead. It's just four times the gamma divided by nine gamma minus five. I don't, I don't know why that happens to be the approximation, but uh, apparently uh, that's an approximation for this. So that approximation ends up at 0.875, which is pretty darn close to 0.877 actually. So it's pretty good. Um, so all that reduces to H sub C D over K is equal to that constant in the front times 0.8 times the Reynolds number to the 0.8 power. I just realized that I might not have made clear exactly what the goal is. The goal is to get the diameter of the coolant tubes. That's it. It's a very simple thing. I mean, all this business is to get the diameter of the coolant tubes and to see if it's feasible to cool the engine with our methane. And um, well, the numbers that we plug in here. So I decided to go with the 2.3 centimeter diameter tubes and 30. You know, remember, we can have 36 of those. Um, and see what that turns out to be as far as the H sub C. Now our goal H sub C was one of the numbers back up here, 3864 or 2493. But what we get out of this using these tubes and that velocity 93, and maybe uh, that should probably be less. And uh, the density is for liquid methane. So maybe we should be using the supercritical methane, which is 200. So that's another little sub note. And then we're dividing by the viscosity, multiplying by that 0.02, which is the combination of those numbers. And what we end up getting at the end of the day is an H sub C of 67,270. Now, if what we're going for, this, this is obviously much higher than the 3,864. And I think what we want is a low number, not a high number. I think that this is the reciprocal of the heat absorption capacity kind of thing. But I'm not sure about that, uh, trying to figure out the logic of this. Um, if we reduce the density, I mean, if the density of liquid is lower, wouldn't that mean it has less capacity to absorb heat? I would think so. But um, also, if we reduce the velocity of it, we get a lower number. But then if there's lower velocity, there's less of stuff passing through, shouldn't that diminish the heat absorption capacity? Uh, but the one thing that seems reasonable is that uh, this goes down when the tube size goes up. Now that might not be obvious right now because it looks like this is at the top, this is on the numerator side, but it's on both sides of the equation. And so over here, 0.023, this diameter is being raised to 0.8 power. Over on the other side, it's just to the first power. 
Eventually, we're going to have to take that diameter and bring it over here by dividing it. So net net, it's uh, 0.023 to the minus 0.2 power, or 1 over the diameter to the 0.2 power. So the higher the diameter, the lower the h sub c. So if I try a few other different situations, limiting the coolant flow to 30 meters per second and using 0.4 millimeter thick tubes and 100 tubes, um, we still get basically the same diameter. Uh, but the result is because we slowed it down, uh, we get a lower h sub c. So again, slowing the coolant down seems to give us a better uh, lower h sub c. Am I aiming for a lower h sub c? This is what I don't know. So I'm working on that and I try a few other situations to try and figure out the extreme cases. Uh, for instance, we don't necessarily have to pass all the methane through the tubes. We could just pass through some of the fuel or uh, yeah, and so the tubes will be smaller and we could have more of them around the chamber in that case and they won't be going, the uh, fluid won't be going as fast. Um, this doesn't seem to help anything. The H sub C gets higher and assuming we want a low H sub C, that's not good. So I'm trying to figure out which way around we want. But I'll set that coolant issue aside for now and in the model I decided to uh, leave some space basically. So this is the model in Blender and we are going to be calculating the mass of the engine or at least estimating it and in order to do so I needed a model to work with. Now to leave space for the coolant you might be able to see so the actual combustion chamber is this and you can see it tapering to the throat and then widening out to the nozzle. The cooling jacket is this and you can see it's very thick at the throat allowing for a lot of material and tubes and but it's still got a fair margin on the sides of the chamber wall which I seem, I've seen other engines and I think it's about consistent with what other engines have. I think that's a reasonable amount of margin for that space and also included in the cooling jacket is the injection system at the top for the fuel. So we've got that. Other systems on the model include the inlet for the methane. At the center here is the gas turbine that we're going to be using as the, uh, the gas turbine is at the top and then there's the turbo pump. The turbo pump is connected to the two inlets by a set of gears. This is one method of um, working the pumps. Another is to have everything in line, uh, which is how the F1 did it, which is why it had one really big tube. And then the others have uh, this sort of arrangement. The, there are various arrangements that we can take a look at. And so we, there's this turbo pump systems for liquid rocket engines. And it gives uh, all of your favorites, basically. Well, at least the American favorites. And it goes through everything from the A7 up to the space shuttle main engines. And it has diagrams of it. You can get this on the NASA technical report server. It's just uh, turbo pump systems for liquid rocket engines. It'll be a nice hefty PDF. And it gives the schematics for this J2 turbo pump. This is the RL10A turbo pump. And this is the MA5 for the Atlas. And the one I modeled after is basically this LR87. This is from the Titan II rocket. And this is the first stage of it. And if you remember the Titan II rocket, it has two combustion chambers at the bottom. It's considered one engine with two combustion chambers, even though they have separate turbo pumps and everything. And one of those combustion chambers, it has about the same thrust as the engine I'm working on. Now, they used um, hypergolic fuels, but the same engine was capable of burning kerosene and oxygen, and there was even a hydrogen oxygen variant of it. Now, I, presumably they'd have to have a different turbo pump for the hydrogen oxygen one, but the fact that it was so versatile gives me hope. So we, what we have here, if we zoom in a little bit, is we've got the oxidizer impeller, which is sort of like a rotor, um, like a screw that sort of sucks in the oxidizer, the oxygen in this case, and it's on this rotor, and that's connected to a set of gears, 
that are connected to the turbine, which is in the center right here. And this turbine inlet manifold is where the a gas from the gas generator, the gas generator creates this gas by igniting some of the methane oxygen, just a little bit, pre-igniting it at a lower uh, pressure than you would see in the main combustion chamber, just to generate enough gas to spin the turbo pump. And so that's the manifold in there. And we see the turbine rotors, and that's connected to these, these sets of gears to make sure that we get the right ratio of oxygen and fuel. I mean, to some extent, that's handled by the fact the pipes, but we also want to make sure that, uh, you know, especially since the reason I'm not doing a single shaft in particular is because we might need to be able to control this a little bit better for throttling. And one of the reasons that turbo pump engines don't throttle that much, whereas pressure fed engines do, is because of the turbo pump. The turbo pump design limits the throttling of the engine. So I don't know if this geared system works a little bit better for throttling, but I suspect it might. Otherwise, it's a lot more uh, mass to handle than say the F1 engine. This is the F1 design, and there's a single shaft. So you can see the turbine inlet manifold for the gases and then the rotors. Uh, so this is the turbo pump and spinning the inducers for the oxidizer and the fuel and it's all on the same shaft. So that's very simple and comparatively lightweight, but the F1 engine doesn't throttle. Uh, the LR87 doesn't either, so I don't know. Um, of these, I, I don't know if any of these engines, well, the special main engine does throttle, but the space shuttle main engine is a special situation. It's actually got two pumps uh, each for the fuel and oxidizer. They're completely separate. It's not one turbo pump for both. There's like four different pumps. There's a low pressure for the fuel, a high pressure for the fuel, a low pressure for the oxidizer, a high pressure for the oxidizer. So that's a very complicated system. So taking a look at our options, there's a lot of information in here that I have not dealt with yet. Uh, that's for later. Uh, but it goes through the stuff pretty well. And so here's our various... We're, we're dealing with a gas generator. So there's a bipropellant gas generator system and you can see the gas generator and the, the turbine and then the fuel and oxidizer. There's a single shaft method. And then there's a mop propellant version. And then there's the thrust chamber uh, tap off. Expander is for the RL-10 and stage combustion, most famous among the American engines presented in this document, used for the space shuttle. So, we are not doing stage combustion because it is complicated and I, I feel like it probably hinders reusability, but we'll have to see. Uh, people might vary on that. But as far as the actual arrangement of the pumps, it gives a few options. These are our, these are our options. Um, single shaft like the F1 and then a turbine between the two pumps. Uh, so that's a little bit different. Geared, Pancake. Pancake is the version I'm using. There's also this offset turbine, single geared turbine, like, sorry, single geared pump. Turbines in series and turbines in parallel. Um, turbines in parallel is the space shuttle, basically, I believe. So, yeah, we're going with Pancake. So back to Blender. Uh, let's go to solid mode. So we've got the gas generator on top. Uh, technically, there should be uh, pipes uh, of methane and oxygen going into there. And then there's the, the turbine, the gears, and then this is where the impellers are. So yeah, and then uh, these big cylinders at the top are the actual pipes from the tanks. Uh, these tiny little cylinders going up are the pressurization lines. So that feeds gas back up to the tank to pressurize them. The tanks only need to be pressurized to about 30 PSI. That facilitates, you know, the fuel getting pushed into the fuel feed system. Because after all, we need some initial pressure into the pipes. Uh, there is an oil system. That's all of this business because we do have to keep our turbine oiled. 
so turbine. I pronounce it turbine most of the time. Uh, so this is the oil canister feeding in. It's pretty far away. It probably it should be closer, but that's more of a artistic license thing than a practical thing. And then the hot oil comes out, needs to be cooled. So what we do is we actually take a little bit of our oxygen that's on its way back to the tank to pressurize the tank and we pass it through the oil coolant. So this cools the oil back into that tank. And so, and then after that, the oxygen goes up. So that's basically how the piping works on this. This is a computer, but that's just, we have to have a computer somehow. Uh, this, in reality, re, in reality, there'd be a lot more to it than this. But uh, we also have all the business with the extension. So that's what I've got hidden right now because we've got the extendable nozzle business, not the colliders. So that's the extendable nozzle, like that. And uh, to get rid of the gas generator exhaust, we've got this exhaust pipe from the gas generator. It's probably not, doesn't need to be that big. I don't think there's gonna be that much of it, but uh, just in case, I haven't calculated how big the pipes need to be. And incidentally, we see a sort of a pipe leading out from the fuel inducer and the oxidizer inducer. Um, I'm, that's probably more artistic license than anything. Really, these would be more integrated with the fuel injection head and not just mere pipes. So you could sort of envision this all wrapping around and probably the fuel injection system should be lower mounted. There's, there's some artistic license here and things should probably be rearranged just a little bit. And if you know if something needs to be rearranged here, uh, feel free to tell me or if you want something added in. It is uh, merely a concept at this point. So yeah, uh, so the gas generator exhaust goes in to help cool the nozzle a bit and then it ultimately comes out through these apertures here. I didn't want a side mounted, you see a lot of engines have a sort of side mounted gas, gas generator exhaust and the problem with that is our nozzle, the extendable nozzle, right? Let's say we've got a pipe going out here. Well, this is gonna hit it. Actually, oh, this, this is sort of hitting that already. See, uh, trying to fit everything in is a pain. That That's, I should have fixed that. I, I made sure to get the cylinder in, I think. It's cutting it close though but you get the picture. That's why the oil is over here too. Uh, it's because like there's just no way to fit it over there. We, uh, we could probably mount these a little bit higher or something. That's another option. But yeah, having the gas generator exhaust come out of the edge of the nozzle seemed like the best arrangement in this case. So that's how it works. And let's take a look at the mass of this engine. Now, obviously for this more complicated engine, it's gonna take a little bit more work to figure out the masses than it was for the pressure fed engine that I designed earlier, which I subsequently named the ED-1. And that engine mainly was cooled by radiation, which means that we just picked really high heat tolerant uh, materials and they would just radiate out the heat because they could take the heat. And of course, with the pressure fed engine, it was operating a very low chamber pressure and low chamber pressure meant that it was physically a very big engine, which meant that it had a lot of surface area with which to cool itself. Uh, in fact, uh, when we take a look at the Shinkansen space plane, you'll see the 81 engines are really big compared, they're about the same size actually. Maybe we can take a look at that. So there's 30 kilonewtons and there's 1000 kilonewtons. This one has more than 30 times the thrust of this, but they're the same size. That's why the pressure fed engine can cool itself with its own materials without having a complicated cooling system, whereas this one can't. Uh, also, it'd be really expensive to use the same materials. We were using tungsten and niobium and those things are really expensive. So if you, uh, and they're mainly used up here in the thrust chamber. The thrust chamber down here is physically larger than that and thicker and has, you know, even if we dump the cooling system, it'd take up a lot more, it'd be much more expensive. 
It also helps that the ED1 is perhaps more reusable than this. We'll see. Um, hopefully this is somewhat reusable, the ED4, but uh, it might not be as easily reusable as a pressure fed engine. So that's the idea. Now to figure out the mass, we're going to use some of Blender's help, but also we have to figure out what materials we, what we're going to be used for which part. First things first, we need to figure out the required thickness of each of the components. And the thickness is primarily going to be determined by the pressure it has to deal with. Um, most of this is going to be measured as a pressure vessel because more than any other force, that's going to be the big thing. And uh, combustion chamber, we know that we have a certain chamber pressure. This is overestimating that chamber pressure. Um, this is 1500 PSI. The actual chamber pressure is 1400. Maybe you want to operate it later, you know. Uh, and multiply by the diameter. Uh, sorry, that's the radius. And divide by the yield strength of Incono, which is what we're using for the combustion chamber, divide by a safety factor of 1.5. And we get uh, 3.9 millimeters. And then the cooling jacket, we're going to use an estimate of three times the engine thickness, or 1.2 centimeters. And uh, you can sort of imagine this as a chamber wall, and then there are little walls between the tubes for the coolant, and then there's an outer coolant jacket wall. And so that's why I'm using three times the engine thickness um, uh, the combustion chamber thickness, I mean, uh, and it's sort of like if you collapse the coolant tube walls, you'll sort of see that you're going to get uh, three times that if you throw in the coolant jacket wall as well, more or less. And um, fuel lines, the thickness, we're actually going to have the fuel lines capable of running at double the combustion chamber pressure and uh, their diameter Oh, sorry, the radius is five millimeters, more or less. Uh, again, there's a fudge factor there. We are making them out of steel for cheapness, though because steel is really heavy, we might want to reconsider that and make them out of titanium. And we're dividing by the safety factor and getting uh, 2.66 millimeters. Nozzle extension and system. Uh, we are assuming that the pistons and all are going to be aluminum and the frame as well, aluminum, and the actual nozzle extension itself is gonna be a carbon composite with a yield strength equivalent to aluminum. So we're calculating based on that, and we get a thickness in the same way as we did before of 1.55 millimeters. Now, if these sound low to you, you'll soon see that it sort of piles up on us because the engine mass that we get using these estimates ends up rather high. So in order to get the volume and area of these components, I use Blender. And if we select one part of it, that's why I made each of these separate parts. And when I say engine, I mean the combustion chamber. Uh, let's say the cooling jacket, actually, because it's more visible. Uh, we just use this Print 3D plugin that comes with Blender, though you have to activate it separately. And we get the volume and we can get the area and so I just took those numbers because it's calculated them for me and we plug them in. So I've written down all those stated volumes and stated areas here and I decided on a method for calculating the mass. In some cases like the CH4 inlet it's pretty much solid. I mean it's not really. Obviously it's got gaps but it's got a lot of gears, mechanisms, um, you know, if we take a look at the schematics for the turbo pump, uh, if we look back up here, I'm, I'm uh, to overestimate it, I'm deliberately overestimating it. And if we take a look at the system, we're overestimating this sort of structure as if it was completely solid. And, you know, is that a good idea? Well, we, we might cut back on that after we get our first estimate. But for now, we're overestimating. So we're using volume for the CH4 inlet. The line, we're just using area times the thickness that we got up there. The computer, I'm just assuming, is 4 kilograms. <laughs> uh, we're just going to go straight for that. Uh, cooling jacket, we're going to use the area times the number we got up there. Uh, same for the combustion chamber area. The extension frame and pistons based on area. The gearing is based on volume because those things will be pretty much solid. Um, locks inlet is volume, uh, locks line, area times that thickness calculated up there, uh, oil system, 
area times the thickness of the nozzle extension system basically we're going to this is um a pretty big overestimation of how much pressure they're likely to encounter 1.5 megapascals if we take a look at just the pressure uh, at the end of the service uh, the sea level nozzle the pressure at the end of the sea level nozzle is 0 0.052 megapascals so we've got 30 times that as sort of a buffer uh, so the nozzle extension can take quite a lot and maybe we're overdoing it but at the end of the day it isn't the biggest contributing factor and i feel like it's realistic yeah, as far as the masses we get out of it so the oil system is also sized to that thickness the turbine is using volume because it's the, you know it's not a solid thing but it's pretty close and the turbine exhaust is area times the thickness and that's the same thickness that we're using this uh, 1.5 megapascals with so we're using titanium with the inlet the line steel cooling jacket in conal combustion chamber in conal extension carbon composite frame and pistons aluminum gearing titanium locks inlet titanium locks line steel oil system steel turbine and turbine exhaust titanium and we've got the densities here we've got the way we're calculating it and we get our masses so the ch4 inlet becomes 227 kilograms and you can see all the masses listed here i put brackets around the bits that are only going on the vacuum nozzle and so the additional mass for the vacuum nozzle is about 0.2 tons so that's the additional mass there and that that seems that might be reasonable uh, but some of these are quite heavy the big bits are the inlets uh, all the things that we measure by volume like the turbine 230 kilograms the LOX inlet 261 kilograms uh, the combustion chamber is obviously heavy so is the cooling jacket obviously and that's mainly because they're using inconal and their thickness is higher than everything else so when we sum it all up we get a first estimate for our sea level ed4 at 1.464 tons the vacuum one with the long nozzle is 1.663 tons so this is a gas generator engine with a thousand kilonewtons and 1400 psi and we've ended up with a sea level thrust weight ratio of 69.63 so that's just the thrust weight ratio of the engine obviously um, you have to put a tank on that but uh, to compare with the Merlin 1D's thrust to weight ratio that has 158 to 180 so that's a lot better we obviously have a very heavy engine compared to our thrust the Merlin 1D gets the same thrust basically out of uh, kerosene and oxygen and we're using methane and oxygen which in some ways might be a little bit more difficult but in some ways is more efficient obviously and should get us more thrust so yeah it's fairly clear we're overestimating the mass and we could do a few things just to change up that like changing from steel to titanium but really the parts that we're using steel for they're not contributing that much mass and they end up making things a little bit cheaper so we'll have to think about exactly how we're doing this and again we might want to dump some of our mass estimate on the volume method parts maybe underdo the nozzle extension a bit but i feel like 0.2 tons isn't the biggest thing so yeah well let's take a look at in practice one possible arrangement for the engines is on a standard rocket in which case we have five of the ed4 engines down here and then on the upper stage a single one of the vacuum nozzle ones and this is sort of like a falcon 5 kind of idea but in this case the interesting thing is the tank that we're using here for the five engines down there would be uh, the shinkansen space planes carrier plane tank you know the carrier plane well, I'll show you that in a moment and then up here we'd be using the tank uh, from the back of the Shinkansen space plane so we're using the same sort of parts uh, and uh, we've got a dragon capsule up here uh, if we have these are procedural tanks right now but if we have procedural tanks of this size then it turns out that with this service module 
we can get the Dragon spacecraft to orbit just fine with plenty of Delta V to spare. Uh, this is actually, if you remember the pressure fed lander engine thing, uh, this is actually that pressure fed lander engine stage that I designed in the first video of the rocket science series. It's just got a wall around it now. And it's got only one of the ED1 engines on it instead of two, though it's got two verniers there. So it's sort of a service module version of that. But anyway, so that's one thing. But what the engines are really designed for is the Shinkansen space plane. And here, things have turned up. Uh, because they're a little bit heavier, the margins are getting a little bit tight. We really need to reduce the mass of the engines because... Uh, this barely gets into orbit as it is. So we've got the big uh, vacuum engines back here. We've got our ED1 engines as the OMS engines and five of the sea level ones over here. I've had to fiddle around with the exact arrangement over here because it's uh, complicated to get this thing properly balanced. And it's not quite properly balanced just yet. But let's take it outside and see how it all works. Okay, you'll have to forgive the floaty launch pads from real KSC. I don't know why it started doing that. But anyway, let's get this thing started. It's got to be a little bit awkward on launch as it tilts away from it where it needs to be. I'm letting KOS handle it because that's smoother. So as you can see, there's a bit of a balance issue. I'm gonna have to work on. I'm also gonna have to work on the plumes of the engine. Now you see the nozzles are retracted here. So currently this is getting its sea level ISPs starting at 300. But uh, once it gets to altitude, it'll extend the nozzle after we pass max Q. Boy, this is going in the wrong direction. But hopefully it'll correct itself. But after we pass, pass max Q, it'll extend those nozzles and uh, work up to the vacuum engine ISP of 373. These sea level ones will max out at 343. So I've uh, worked on the aerodynamic model of this. The What you see visually is just the skin and structure. And I used additional parts to put the internal masses. For instance, we have now the RCS tanks as a separate part to make sure they're applying their masses in the right place. We've also got the cabin as a separate part. So there's a cabin mass here. Currently there's nobody on board, but if there was, the Kerbals would sit in there. We also have the rear tanks as a separate part so that they apply their center of mass properly. I discovered in Blender that uh, you can just move the geometry to the center of mass, assuming that the whole thing has a constant density, which it does, because we're making the structure out of aluminum and, of course, there's the heat tiles, but they're more or less evenly distributed. So I could use the geometry as an estimate of the, of the center of mass, where the mass is distributed, and Blender can automatically move it to the center of mass of the geometry. So I did that. So that is done. And so the structure and the skin have the correct center of mass position. Still, there's a lot of work to do as far as figuring out the aerodynamics of this. As you can see, the nozzles have extended. And now these engines are moving up to 373, whereas these have peaked out close to 343. Uh, the way I did this with the nozzle extension is uh, action group, and the action group extends the nozzle and also switches the engine mode. So it's sort of like an uh, engine mode switch the way we have it with the rapier engine. Except a little bit different because it's realism overall. To maintain balance, the carrier plane has switched off its outer two engines. And it'll switch off, there we go. Now it's just down to the center engine. That's because it's getting so much lighter than the space plane side. It's feeding fuel into the space plane side. There's a fuel line between them. That whole system needs to be refined as well. But uh, right now the space plane is full of fuel. And the, there is a little bit of reserve fuel in the carrier plane's uh, RCS tank up here. 
so that's locked for maneuvers so that I can land safely. Okay, getting ready for a separation of the carrier plane. Now, the big engines, the ones with the big nozzles, the vacuum engines, they don't gimbal very much. They only gimbal 2 degrees. The carrier plane's engines, the sea level ones, they gimbal 8 degrees. So that's one problem as far as maintaining balance. I didn't feel comfortable having these gimbal more than the 2 degrees for obvious reasons. As you can see from this currently, the empty mass of this is 27.38 tons, and that includes the mass of the engines. And if you watch the video on the Shinkansen space plane, the design of the space plane, I think it was like uh, space plane structures, um, you'll see how I arrived at the empty mass of this. And, you know, it's a tight system. And it turns out, after doing the calculations, I didn't get what I wanted, right? I wanted a system that had a payload capacity. This really doesn't have a payload capacity. It can carry passengers, but uh, it's just not feasible to put in any serious cargo. Okay, we're about to make orbit. And there we are. But... 138 meters per second left so we can make orbit but boy is it a close thing and probably we have some work to do but we can retract the nozzle again and that would be how it needs to be for re-entry obviously we can't have the nozzle sticking out probably I should have a bigger body flap but oddly enough in the SBH right now it seems to indicate our center of lift is too far back which is funny because the center of mass is pretty far back too but yeah anyway this is the progress we've made and for now I'll leave it at this so we have developed a larger set of methane oxygen engines and hopefully I'll get to put them to some use maybe not the space plane just yet but maybe that rocket launcher is promising so with that I'll say thank you for watching I hope you enjoyed this video if you did enjoy this video please do press like if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time.